intellectual issues, issues around um, exclusion, um, issues around um, access to or barriers to entry. Um, and we do this in four windows, um, support for work seekers. Of course, um, much of what we're going to focus on today is the enterprise development window, infrastructure window, and the institutional um, capacity building window. So, I mean, we understand our strengths, we understand the players in the market, so we do it through intermediaries because they have knowledge of their beneficiaries, they have access to networks, finance, um, skill and capital and we bring this all together and what we you know we leverage it um you know to be able to bring in the public um public uh, a mandate from the public from the public sphere around development outcomes as well as our, our partner um, mandates so with that said um thank you again for joining us um this is also an opportunity for us to um to implement um, one of our theory of change, um, the pillars of our theory of change, which is to to share knowledge, to disseminate, to engage. So please um, do engage with us. Um, we hope it will be a fruitful and knowledgeable session for you. I'll hand you over to Ben, who's going to take you through the first part of the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh... This is Ben. My name is Ben Kasimukile. I'm a technical financial specialist, just for introduction. And I'm going to switch off my camera uh, so that to allow for the event with, to work well. Uh, so where do we start? So uh, just by starting to say, what is uh, uh, blended finance? So according to the OECD, blended, blended finance is the use of development of finance for the mobilization of additional funds towards sustainable development in developing countries. Uh, just as an uh, introduction, next slide. I hope that definition covers all. So just as a background, I uh, would want to start by having a look at uh, what are the challenges, which sphere uh, do we sit at when we look at uh, uh, the potential of SMEs in South Africa? I think many of us would have heard or would have seen that uh, the drive now is that uh, SMEs are supposed to be the ones that give us more jobs, uh, that grows uh, the economy, and um, that is able also to 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 provide uh, a livelihood for for many people and bring people out of poverty. But there are then challenges uh, when it comes to access to finance, and uh, within the Jobs Fund, we have learned uh, quite a lot. And some of the, 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 the issues that we present here um, uh, are from the learnings that we have seen. Uh, and in, in general, um, we, we have a problem statement that says that there is an inability of uh, SMEs to, to, to access finance or appropriately uh, uh, structured finance solutions. What is the root cause for that? Sometimes it's the high levels of perceived risks in the sector or in the SMEs uh, because Surely, sometimes it's, it is that the SME is really linked to the individual. So, if the individual, the entrepreneur, is not doing that well, uh, you know, there is, the risk attached to him is transferred even to the to the enterprise that they run. Then there's also the issue of restrictive lending policies and you know, in assess, uh, inappropriate assessment processes and criteria where uh, people or SMEs are grouped uh, uh, together, and there's a one. Uh, size fit or approach that's used by financiers. And uh, some of them is the minimum uh, collateral uh, uh, requirements, which SMEs might not have. Sometimes also is because of how soon or how long the SMEs would have been in operation. Uh, they might not have that much of a trading history to try and, uh, uh, and justify uh, a seat on, on the table. And the lack of historical financial statement, cash mis mismatch, where you know there is no proper keeping or maintenance of records, and um, so these are some of the things that we we've seen as root causes. And what is then the negative or impact, uh, you know, uh, in the short term, uh, immediate term, and long term? Uh, it is the high levels of decline in the applications, the, the lack of growth and sustainability in the sector, which then has negative implications on the economy and job creation, and uh, inappropriately structured solutions if 
SMEs get funding, sometimes they get a term sheet uh, that is prime plus, uh, plus, uh, plus seven, plus 10. And though when the SME is, uh, is desperate for money, they will take those fund, that fund uh, or those funding that's being offered, but they will be running into challenges because the, the loans are not, uh, or the funding is not properly structure, structured. And then the cost of uh, funding sometimes is also uh, unaffordable. And of course, we then have sometimes in the sectors lack of transformation in some, 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 some sectors, and also the lack of interest by commercial funders in funding developmental activities due to these perceived risks and low returns. And also this might lead to, to, uh, to all these risks as well that I might need like guarantee mechanisms or some safeguards uh, to, to try and attract capital investments. Next slide, please. Good. Um, so what exactly needs to be achieved in, in terms of uh, SME uh, financing? Here we, uh, we, we, we look at the aim. What is the aim? The aim is to, for SMEs to be able to access finance, but also what we've learned uh, within the Jobs Fund uh, over uh, the number of, uh, of, of periods or calls that we've had or calls or proposals that we've had is that maybe finance uh, on its own is not uh, the only source uh, to or the only solution to creating jobs or to make sure that uh, SMEs are sustainable. There are all other levers that you might need uh, things to do with uh, um, uh, access to, 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 to market, uh, you know, good uh, reporting, etc. So uh, the aim really is sometimes to reduce the risk perceptions of investors and funders and also to enable a behavioral change in lending uh, practices to, to SMEs. By doing that, you then widen the market uh, in, the, in, in the longer term as well. How can this be achieved, you know, uh, by adjustment of the current methodologies for, 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 for finance approval? So by that, we say uh, there has to be an intervention that looks at SMEs um, with different lens from, from other operate, or operating businesses. By doing that, you make sure that uh, you, you, you have a process of approval um, that allows uh, SMEs to be selected. So you might have to look at a, at a selection criteria or as we have seen in the jobs fund, sometimes what is needed is really technical support uh, to, 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 to the SMEs uh, so that they're able to, uh, to, 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 to speak or their business proposal, speak to the market, speak to, to everything and also providing uh, the market with what is called a, a proof of concept. Um, so some of these learnings um, uh, helps in, in, in making sure that there is a, there's behavioral change. And, uh, and also that under certain circumstances within uh, certain sectors, risks can be reduced sufficiently uh, for financial institutions uh, to, uh, to, to access SMEs uh, differently and also uh, to make uh, sustainable uh, funding solutions available to SMEs. And uh, how does the Jobs Fund contribute to this process? We do that by, or we've done that uh, by testing various blended finance solutions and also by demonstrating alternative risk reduction uh, strategies within various sectors and geographies um, for, for particular cohorts of SMEs. So uh, in, in some examples or uh, some some uh, SMEs that were funded, they're in vast uh, uh, ge geographical space, and we, we, we have uh, like group uh, uh, savings funding, which funds rural women to do uh, a, a, a business where they use uh, peer to, uh, peer, -to -peer uh, as, as, as security, more like a stock fair, uh, but which is securitized by, by, uh, by, by each, each one's neighbor who vouch for, for one another and then groups are able to, to repay funds. And there's been a huge uh, success in those areas. Uh, and also we do that by encouraging uh, institutions to amend their current policies uh, or current practice. By that, we say when we part partner with some, some of these uh, institutions, we say, uh, is there a way that we can uh, develop what is called developmental um, credit policies with them, which then allows for, for, for the, for not, not, not for the usual credit uh, 
uh, committee approvals that you usually have, but we have the ones that are amended to take into consideration the journey of the SMEs. Uh, next slide, please. Good. So uh, how does the Jobs Fund uh, end up participate in these financing models? So over the number of years that have been in operation, the Jobs Fund has received a number of applications from various applicants seeking to address uh, the following um, financing challenges. That's lack of finance just in general, and sometimes a lack of affordable uh, finance in specific sectors. Uh, by that, uh, there are specific sectors that that um, low, low margin, uh, high volumes, and uh, so in that case, you really need um, uh, finance that's that's cheaper and that enables a free cash flow to be created. And when we say that uh, in specific sectors that are requiring uh, intervention, some of blended models um, to address affordability and financial indebtedness of, uh, of beneficiaries. And um, some of the broad financial models that the Jobs Fund has approved includes general debt funding, lending finance, uh, guarantee mechanisms that are able to, 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 to guarantee to attract capital and also to, to work as a, a fallback uh, guarantee to, so that the fund does not quickly deplete. Then equity funding uh, models where uh, communities uh, are involved in uh, in, 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 in maybe farming or, or where they are resident and there's economic activities there and communities want to be involved there. We've also assisted that. We've done also what is impact capital, uh, which is uh, which 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 is which also helps with uh, with impactful uh, investment in, in in certain sectors. We also have what is called uh, social uh, impact bonds or pay for performance, and uh, these are some of the broad models that we have. Uh, funded within the jobs fund and at this juncture i would like to hand over to to nazim uh, I, I think let's just go to the next slide so this this slide talks about just give the a synopsis of the of the jobs fund uh, project that we funded so far uh we have about 44 of them that falls under this portfolio which says general debt funding blending finance guarantee mechanisms equity funding service group that i spoke about and uh uh, Nazim will be able to expand more on those and impact bonds. And these are the sectors that we also kept, uh, uh, cater for, or we funded as well, which is agriculture, housing, green economy, education, uh, construction, logistics, health, and man manufacturing. And how much of it is best so far? Uh, 2.1 billion rand. And how much uh, mesh funding have we leveraged? Uh, as you can see that um, when we talk about access or making the grant bigger, uh, we've we used our 2.1 billion to access 6.5 billion uh, at, a, at a funding ratio or mesh funding ratio of one is to three. So these are some of the, the, the on a, this is on the, on, the, on the fund level, but also you'd want to see some of these things in the, in the individual projects where you're able to leverage more. And by so doing, you, you are almost addressing the challenge that we have. And so far we've created 76,000 jobs uh, and uh, in SMEs of about 33, uh, thousand um, farmers and, uh, and and SMEs have been supported uh, over time, and most of those are women, youth, and also uh, 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 private P PDI uh, people uh, that own those uh, entities. So after this snapshot, I think I want to hand over to my colleague Nazim, who is able to just give us a, a rundown of the financing models that we have. Uh, thank you, Nazim. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome. Um, yeah, my job is really to look at the, some of the models that we've done, some examples and so on. And I think the to say that access to funding has been around for a long time. Um, since I think when the job fund started, it was already there. Various pieces of research was, has been done. Say what the funding shortfall is. Um, so it, it is and remains and will probably remain for some time a topical issue. Um, there's still some uncertainty at what the end game should be. Is it government's role to continue to provide grants to private to various types of institutions to be able to implement these models? And this is where the jobs funds role really becomes important. Or is it the role to test models? Proof concepts 
and then enable um, institutions to go off and implement projects without a government grant. And for me, that that would be the end game, the panacea that we're all looking to do. And in that way, would unlock large sums of, of capital uh, for SMEs. And again, the Jobs Fund role in looking at all of these models is really to push the boundaries that are currently there, to test concepts, models that inform how best to address this uh, uh, critical issue. Now, key is, is what Ben spoke about is the problem, right? The problem is wider than finance. While this webinar deals with the issue of finance access and whatnot, finance alone very seldom or, or is very rare that that is the, the only issue faced by any SMEs. So the package of support it becomes very important. Finance is simply an element of that package of support. Package of support may include market access, technical skills training and technical skills transfer, business development support. What you often have are entrepreneurs in small businesses Technically, they're very good, but they have absolutely no idea as to how to, to optimally run their business. So all of these become very important within that package of support. So as Ben has shown, um, we have looked at our portfolio and categorized what we have funded. I think it's fair to say in four board categories. Um, the first one being the, uh, the general funding, um, general debt funding. Here you have two types of general funding. You have where a grant is awarded to an intermediary. Um, the beneficiary becomes, but receives a grant coupled with commercial funding. Blending happens with the intermediary and ultimately we reduce the cost of capital for that person. Uh, a second type of model would be where we provide an intermediary with a grant that is then blended with that commercial funding by the intermediary and intermediaries receive a loan without a grant portion. And I think it's very important to say that blended finance model cannot ever be everything to everybody. There are certain SMEs because they're not an homogenous group that would require a grant, cannot afford to take finance or, or loan. There are others that require a grant and alone. And then there are others that progress to a level where they they are able to, 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 to accept or receive loans as such and grow their business and repay those loans. So the grant, the purpose of the grant funding is, is really in, in terms of this category, is really to crowd in as a dealer's mechanism commercial funding. That grant is then blended with commercial funding. Uh, to, to reduce the cost of capital to SMEs or the cost of funding to SMEs. Um, in many cases, that grant provides first loss provision um, to, to that uh, um, fund. Um, it can provide a direct interest rate subsidy to beneficiaries. And as Ben spoke about, it, it could provide an equity provision. What that means is many of the funders, um, including uh, development finance institutions, require beneficiaries or SMEs to provide equity to match their loans. And that is really, um, I'm sorry, just go back one. That really speaks to what the grant does. It provides them that equity component so that they can access um, that uh, loan capital. Um, and we, we talk about relaxation of funding terms very importantly, and this is sector specific. We, we're looking to have more payment moratoriums in place for specific sectors like long-term horticulture. Uh, we're looking to relax payment terms. Um, generally, five years is the term. We're looking to, to increase, push that boundary, and then ultimately reduce collateral requirements for SMEs, which ultimately is a big um, uh, issue for them. As Ben said, they, they, they may not have accumulated that collateral or may not have been in operation long enough. The blending ratio has to be appropriate, right? Very often, and the tendency is always to reduce the grant for a given level of commercial capital. What that simply means is that the rate that is paid or the blended funding rate paid by beneficiaries would be higher for a lower with a lower grant. So one has to be very cognizant of that. It has to be industry and sector specific. The product has to have relevance within the market it plays. Um, 
and we often our grant provides critical funding mass for some content to be tested at scale, uh, which again is very important in, in many a sector. In terms of examples, next slide please. So we've got three examples in this uh, category. The first one is a project where we supported the industry body to bring black citrus growers into the value chain or the lucrative ex uh, export market. Why that is important is because a farming unit is generally recognized, a commercial farming unit is generally recognized at about 40 hectares in the sector. A, a black farmer could have the 40 hectares, but because he's selling only into the local market or via the bucky trade, as we call it, his earnings does not necessarily lead him to a specific level of profitability. In the export markets, having access to export markets, the UK, Germany, etc., China, for example, the selling prices for the same product is about three, between three and four times higher than what he can sell it to in, 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 in South Africa. So one has to look at problems faced by a lot of the, the black growers at the moment is the product quality, the scale of their production, and that speaks directly to technical capacity or ability or technical uh, processes, production processes being used, and the cultivars. For example, China, big market, they focused on soft citrus. They're not particularly interested in Valencia's, they want soft citrus. So if you have all black growers growing Valencia, which is the biggest market, you have a problem because they cannot then access uh, um, international markets. So far, we funded 10 transactions uh, with value about 155 million. The target is to get to 30. We're targeting about 884 upwards hectares uh, to be planted additional hectares within that sector. And we contracted for 1,726 uh, permanent and seasonal jobs over the three year implementation period. Now, of course, this is a perfect example of any project does not happen in isolation, does not implement in isolation. This year, we saw huge problems within the citrus industry stemming from shipping rates into, into Europe, uh, increasing by about 400%. We've had significant problems in the ports, all of which impacted both SMEs in the sector or emerging farmers in the sector, as well as large players. So there was a huge drop in profitability. So we saw a lot of applicants, potential applicants to this product, pull their applications simply because given where they were currently, they don't see a way to take an additional debt. One must expect that, that is a business decision and one must respect uh, uh, that. Yes, the product still, the product still um, produced good results in my opinion this year, and we're hoping for better next year as that cyclicality or, or issues get resolved. Uh, the achievements to date, we've reduced the cost of capital to emerging farmers by having a leverage of about 1.6 times uh, funding levels to those emerging farmers is just at or just below prime at the moment, the blended rate, and the 180 million rand jobs is really used as the subsidy to be able to reduce that cost so that these citrus growers can grow um, into that market, access the international market, and on the road to sustainability. Thank you. Next slide. We've also done one in the deciduous fruit value chain. This one is slightly different to the citrus growers there with the beneficiary received a grant and a loan. In this one, um, it, it's really a follow on project of a previous one where beneficiaries received grant. We've then developed a product or, or sorry, the industry body developed a product whereby those uh, beneficiaries who have progressed to a level of commercial status to be able to provide them with an industry-led fund, um, sustainable fund, rolling fund, who will continue to grow and provide uh, access to funding to these uh, emerging industry players and, and therefore grow the value chain, grow access to that value chain, contribute towards an industry that has struggled, I think it's fair to say, struggled for a while to address the transformation within that industry. To date, we've Funded 19 transactions, the value of about 225 million at a leverage ratio of two times. We've planted over 200 hectares. This is the next year alone. We're planting a project 
is planning to plant an additional 100 hectares, and we've produced thus far 1,211 permanent and seasonal jobs have been facilitated to date. The target is in the region of 1,700 jobs over the full project period. Again, the grant serves to reduce the cost of capital to emerging farmers through blending um, and to establish the fund. That's ultimately the aim of the product, to establish, capacitate that fund so it can continue to lend to the industry appropriately structured finance uh, into, into perpetuity. Uh, next slide, please. And the third one is again one, a project that we're very proud of because it is a very difficult sector to navigate and that is the construction sector. Um, everybody always talks about the, the number of jobs that can be produced by the sector. The problem is that the smaller contractors have, are having issues or barriers in terms of entry to, uh, 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 into the sector via the large uh, uh, contractors, of course, but they're having problems. So what this project has done is create a facility where short to medium term finance is provided to these contractors, which then allows them to enter the value chain, fund contracts and, and so forth, and thereby gaining the necessary technical skills and financial track records so they can for, go forth and play meaning more meaningful role within the sector and become more profitable and continue to create jobs into into the future um, thus far the 200 million rand grant provided to this fund leveraged 390 million rand um, in loans to beneficiaries which is roughly a two times ratio uh, we've created 2077 jobs uh, within that project and the achievement, I mean, that 2077 jobs is, is a very good number in our opinion, but the actual benefit of this project is firstly the progression of those small con smaller contractors within the CIDB rankings, which really determines what size of project and contract they can implement. So we've had progression in that on these uh, uh, SMEs, the 500 SMEs have been contracted and impact with, with skills, access to finance, et cetera. They have completed 5 billion rand worth of construction projects uh, over the period. Impairment rates, very proud to say, is below 5%. And again, it proves, even within a very difficult sector, very cyclical sector, that it can be done. SMEs can be funded at a level where and proven to be less risky than what the perception may be in the market. And also at the moment, the repayment favorable, favorable repayment terms allows for the sustenance of the jobs and the SMEs. Um, and I think that's the key. Sustainability of the SMEs into the future, which means sustainability of the jobs that's being created and also the ability to create additional jobs uh, into the future. Next slide, please. So the next category of funding that we've provided is to fund guarantee mechanisms. Um, now, a guarantee mechanism, slightly different to the blend, the traditional blended finance mechanism, where the grant is actually not used to physically lend to beneficiaries or SMEs. It is used as a de-risking mechanism to be able to leverage funding from the private sector or, or from wherever, and thereby by reducing that risk, reducing the interest rate that that commercial funding comes into the project, and they've been able to provide access to affordable growth funding to SMEs. Um, the in, one thing that we've learned very important in this uh, uh, type of uh, project is the institutional structure. Um, now, of course, the grant needs to be ring fenced from the implementer or the provider of commercial funding. And what we've done in, in our projects is for the commercial funding to be housed in the lending fund that is, is operated and controlled by the partner, by our intermediary who then lends to the SMEs. The guarantee portion which is provided by the grant is housed in an independent trust, governed by independent trustees and in terms of a trustee. Of course, one, one looks at the trust deed, its terms and so forth, and very important, the trust deed sets out the terms under which losses within the lending fund is approved and paid for by the trust. And it's very important that one has a handle on that, one understands what that is, 
And key issues to consider, right? Firstly, is the level of first loss coverage that the guarantee provides. Is it equitable relative to other lenders? Because if you're guaranteeing 100% of the loan, then the lender himself, the commercial lender, actually carries no risk. And we have been very uh, uh, focused on having some level of equity in that first loss coverage. Um, equity risk sharing provisions, again, it is about equity. Does the grant unlock sufficient capital or at a, in a way where risk is shared between the guarantee? Because the guarantee's main job, and this is if there's enough research to be done by the OECD, that in terms of leveraging, the guarantee mechanism is able to leverage more, more commercial funding into a project than any other blended finance uh, product. So in a case where, where the project is, the guarantee will always be lower than the blending or should be a multiple lower than the blended fund, right? So in at no stage can the guarantee guarantee 100% of the loan. So some of the, the risk has to be carried by the lender. And it is that relationship that is one that has to, one has to be comfortable with, has got to be equitable. Um, and very important, understand how the guarantee facilitates access and affordability to SMEs. So if one talks about commercial funders, market conditions do not stay constant. They move, you have, um, what we call what is called bear markets, where, opt, where, where investors are very optimistic, etc. And then you've got, uh, sorry, that's a bull market. And then we have a bear market where pessimism is is the order of the day. Man funding in a bear market or a, a very optimistic market, people are far more willing to provide you with that capital than when they are pessimistic. Now, the blending or, or the funding the leverage ratio is set over the long term. Now that has to navigate the vagaries of that uh, perception in the market. And one has to understand and to stress test the model to understand in times of difficulty, is that lending ratio or leverage ratio too high to operate within a pessimistic market? So one has to look at all of, all of those issues. Um, um, how will commercial funding be raised? Is it an active process? Is it a passive process? How are the way? What is the source of that funding? Understanding the impact on those markets of various issues, so you can try and predict or understand what your risks are in terms of implementation. And then, how will guarantee enable additional funding to be raised over the long term? So, a project is three, four years, five years, even sometimes. But a guarantee is there to last for a much longer period. So one would expect that guarantee to raise additional funding over and above what has been raised in the funding. One has to understand how that mechanism works, what type of advocacy is being done by the intermediary in informing the market, displaying its results, showing um, proof of concept so that additional capital can be raised for a given guarantee. Um, a question that has come up within the jobs fund in particular at the moment is, is it optimal to provide a guarantee into perpetuity? So do you provide a funder with a guarantee into perpetuity? Or do you say, we will provide it to you for 10 years or five years, whatever that period may be. Once you have proven concept and able to reduce the risk perception within your portfolio, are you then able to raise funding without the guarantee? And I think that is something um, that we're very interested to, to see the results of. Um, we have implemented it into a new, or incorporated it into a new project of ours, and it's something that we're very interested to see the results of uh, during the, 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 the process. Next slide, please. Nazim? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, um, I just think um, at this point, perhaps you may want to address a question around um, guarantees. Landiwe, um, we see your question. We'll address it in Q&A. But just whilst Nazim is on the topic of guarantees um, from Fidelis, which is what is your take on the performance on the NT Saab bounce back scheme, formerly the loan guarantee scheme? 
Um, so what is our take? And also, as the government tries to improve performance, what lessons can be drawn? So, I mean, you 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 can just infuse that perhaps into your, your discussion, because I, I think the next yeah. slide is still on guarantees. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Next slide, please. So in terms of the model that we have implemented, um, a grant of 100 million was awarded, unlocking um, funding of about 900 million um, in commercial funding. We funded um, 22 transactions um, or, or sub intermediaries with that funding and benefited about 10,000 beneficiary SMEs through the project. The level of leverage, very importantly, is 10 times. Uh, and again, coming back to my point, that was four years ago. That was appropriate four years ago. It may not be appropriate in the current market conditions. So one has to be very careful in, in casting that leverage ratio in, in stone. The project has created 7,130 7, permanent jobs over that implementation period. Um, and I think I've covered uh, the, the achievements so far, the, the proof of concept, the ability to grow that guarantee into, into the future and thereby raise additional money at a lower rate for, for, for SMEs. Now, the question around the performance of the loan guarantee scheme, of course, we don't necessarily see updated information as to how much of the the bounce back scheme has been drawn down. Oh, sorry, let me take a step back. I think it's fair to say that the initial loan guarantee scheme was not successful. And there are various uh, reasons for that. Treasury has put forward that banks relax the criteria to put, um, and hence SMEs could, could access funding via that without the guarantee. Um, but I think there were structural issues within the, the um, within the first scheme that, to be fair, has been acknowledged and addressed within the second scheme. Now, the bounce back scheme, I think we all know it was launched in April 2022. Um, it was a 15 billion rand guarantee provided via the South African Reserve Bank to be, to be made available so that SMEs via participating banks could access funding. Um, and it was estimated that that guarantee would unlock about 73 billion rand in, in funding from those institutions, which again gives you a, a leverage or a, a, a leverage ratio about five times. Um, now, the performance when we, we looked at it late last year and there had been 140 million rand drawn down of the bounce back scheme. Now, of course, um, October last year is five months after April. It's very early in the game. Um, people need to, to revise systems, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to, to go and access that. So it's very early. I will qualify that right now. 140 million to my mind was slightly disappointing still, but again, it's early days and, and we need to see how that unfolds. Very importantly, when we talk about guarantees before, we'll say that, you know, you're implementing exactly what National Treasury is doing. The job fund role is to test certain concepts. OK, so in the guarantee mechanism, uh, guarantee mechanism that we have just implemented, it is about testing funding to a particular cohort of SMEs that would not normally have been funded. That is not necessarily a provision in the bounce back economy. It's simply to provide, to enable financial institutions with a guarantee in place to provide affordable funding to SMEs in general. We are testing funding to a cohort that could never have received funding previously for the reasons that Ben spoke to earlier. And the second issue is we're testing the concept of providing a guarantee into perpetuity as opposed to having it in place for a particular period and how that works. Um, and I think I've had some discussions with, with, with banks um, on, on why it is they didn't participate in the first one, why they didn't, why they slowed to take up the second. And of course, I, can't, I cannot speak for the banks, right? They, they've got to pronounce on that themselves. But I think what we, must always be careful of is prescribing to a bank 
at what level of funding you will fund. Because rightly or wrongly, and I'm not pronouncing on, on, on whether we're right to do so or not, but from the bank's perspective is always that the credit decision remains theirs. A key part of that credit decision is the funding uh, or the rate at which funding is applied. And, and I think a lot of that has to do, people are trying to get their head around something that's in the bank back scheme, trying to get their head around that and how they actually play in that space. Um, but like I said, it's still early days in the bounce back scheme, um, in the bigger scheme of things. Thanks, Jim. I hope I've covered that question. If not, uh, please reiterate and I'll come back to it. Next slide, please. Perhaps, Nazim, just before you go on, if I could just intervene. I, I don't know that you fully addressed this, the, the, the latter part of Adelis's question. And it's actually just so 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 it was about the, the bounce back scheme, right? But he wanted to ask a little, he asked also about the lessons that can be drawn from the jobs fund portfolio and experience. And perhaps you want to talk to um the issue of finance um in and of itself is not a sufficient um mechanism if you are looking at that particular cohort of the market. Thanks. Agreed. Uh thank you. Uh Najan, indeed, I think we made the point earlier as well. When you put a finance scheme in place, you're trying to address a particular problem from an, from an SME perspective, right? We have learned both through our blended finance uh, solutions or, or not our wider portfolio that in providing finance, you're simply addressing one of the issues. Right. What Bounce Bank doesn't necessarily do is force people to, to support the SMEs in a wider context than simply finance. What we have learned that that is imperative. It is imperative that you provide and we require it. It is a key part of what we assess um, and what successful uh, um, um, applicants to the jobs fund must have in place. It must have in place a support program for that SMEs to develop that SME more holistically, to provide support with financial statements, which they don't have generally. Some, most of them don't. Um, technical skills, implementation processes, um, et cetera, and access to market for argument's sake. There's no point in providing somebody funding to fund growth into a market that he can't get access to. Right? So it has to be a package of support. It has to be holistic development of our SMEs. Um, otherwise, you know, you can't really fund SMEs without those. For example, the NEF, I know for a fact, we dealt with a, a, a person yesterday. The NEF said one condition on his, uh, on his uh, finance application, and that was they want to see off-take arrangements. Other than that, sorry, no deal, right? So, all of that speaks to the holistic development of, of, of the SMEs for any scheme, being it a guarantee scheme, a blended finance scheme, to be successful and, and lead to sustainability of SMEs and therefore jobs. Thank you. I, I hope I've covered it. Thanks, Fidelis. Um, and then the next category is really the equity funding arrangements. Now, Ben spent some time on this. Um, and it's really to enable participation of beneficiaries, communities in, in acquiring transformative stakes in, in industries or businesses. For example, a workers' trust. Um, very often they would be required to provide equity and the grant would provide them that equity to participate within a particular business. Um, very important, right? Again, the common theme with all our products is all the blended finance is that the grant reduces the risk to those investors. Investments in this case being the equity providers, if not the, the, the job fund. Um, it provides a key thing like we've just discussed now. now the, the importance of, for example, a strategic partner buying an equity stake with a workers partner is that you then have a technical partner experience in the industry, who is able to provide technical and business development services 
within a given structure, having built a relationship with the communities and black shareholders, uh, uh, etc. And that is, is again a key issue I've said before. So other key issues is the shareholding structure and selection criteria. Of course, what we don't want is equity structures to be lopsided in favor of the established business. We need to look at how the beneficiaries has been selected. Do they work on the farm? For example, if, you, if you're doing a worker's trust on a farm, it creates problems when a large part of the shareholders in the trust do not actually work on the farm. Because remember, the, the return for a shareholder is long term. He doesn't necessarily get a salary. So all of those structures and selection criteria has to be looked at very carefully. The rights of the beneficiaries within the, the structure needs to be very clear, needs to be equitable, and needs to be understood by the beneficiaries. Because in certain industries, the payback period is very long. So it may be up to five years before those beneficiaries actually receive any benefits from that investment. Now, obviously, within a community structure, that needs to be understood. The jobs fund is not, it's a non-negotiable within a community-based project that we have adequate social facilitation in place to address these issues as they come up. Um, because these issues have potentially the right, you could do everything right. If you get the, the shielding, the rights, the understanding, the buy-in of communities, if you get that part wrong, your entire project will fail probably because you can't really sort it out after the fact. So all of that is very important, risk sharing, commensurate with contributions. We've had applications where commercial partners come along and they say, I want to give 50% of, of, or help me fund 50% stake in my business with a workers' trust or into a new entity, we're buying a new farm, for example. We've had instances where that commercial partner or that entity, or the white farmer basically, or the, no, sorry, that's the wrong word, apologies. The established partner makes no contribution towards the new entity, yet he gets a 50% stake. Now, of course, what you must marry against that is the value of the contribution in terms of technical skill, et cetera, et cetera what that contribution entitles that shareholder to. So all of that, the, the equity of and risk sharing is, is crucial. And then within a structure like this, very important is the skills transfer. The conversion in a workers trust for argument's sake of an employee into a shareholder. How does that skills transfer take place? Um, and then very important is an equitable exit strategy. And when we say that we do not mean that the, the, the established partner must simply hand over his stake to, to the workers' trust or black shareholders. What we're looking to see is an equitable strategy whereby the established partner will exit to the benefit of those beneficiaries in an equitable way, right? Pricing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Now, outcomes-based funding is I think it's fair to say it's pretty new in South Africa, right? Now you get two types. You could have a social impact bond or you could have a pay for performance model. Now a social impact bond, the difference between the two is simply that a social impact bond will have third party investors providing working capital to implementers. All of this happens by an intermediary. Um, and whereas a pay for performance, implementers themselves raises the capital or use its own funding to fund implementation. Within a outcomes-based funding model, be it social impact bond, be it pay for performance models, implementers, funders, having provided the working capital for implementation, are refunded or repaid with a while out of return, generally in social impact bonds, it will be with a return, according to agreed rate upon achievement of a verified outcome. Now that's a mouthful, right? So I'll break it down. So they're getting it repaid with a return or without a return. Um, there has to be an agreed rate at which they get paid. So the rate card basically, and from here, if we're creating a job, we need to understand what is the cost to the implementer or the, the, the SME for argument's sake in this case, in creating that job so that we establish a rate per job. Very important, we've learned and we've implemented, you'll see it in the next slide, 
where we're starting to differentiate between the rate for various categories of jobs. Low skilled jobs, medium skilled jobs, high skilled jobs. The rate card cannot be the same for each and every one of them. So we're starting to differentiate between the various types of jobs or quality of jobs that have been created and a verified outcome. Now, that is probably the most difficult thing to do because in a case where you're creating jobs, it becomes easy because you have a job, you have a job contract and some, you can verify the outcome. But on other social issues, um, for example, um, gender reduction in gender based violence, having a program to do that and, and repaying implementers when certain targets have been achieved. We do not necessarily have reliable data on which to base that outcome. And, and this is a problem that is faced with a number of initiatives that wanted to launch in South Africa. And the argument was about what is that outcome? And they could not reach agreement um, with that. Um, so why outcomes-based models, right? Um, now, I don't think on this forum I have to speak it about the, the constrained public purse. Now, what, what outcomes-based models does, it improves the efficiency of government spend. Not necessarily the amount, but the efficiency, because you are only paying for the achievement of specific outcomes. Social returns. So we have various social issues. Jobs is one of them, right? Outcomes-based funding models have proven themselves across the world to be appropriate for addressing all of those social uh, uh, issues. Now, very often an investor or a funder will say, but how do we price this thing? What a social impact bond will do is allow you to monetize that social return, which is, as I said, all, often an impediment. It promotes innovation by shifting the focus to outcomes. If you are an implementer who knows that you are going to be paid 50,000 rand for argument's sake for producing a job. It is then incumbent on you or you are incentivized to innovate in how you create that jobs so that your cost is lower than 50,000. You're getting 50,000, right? So your cost is lower than 50,000. So it allows for innovation that incentivizes implementers to innovate in how all of these outcomes uh, are achieved. Of course, that is linked to annual reviews of what that cost would be so that the outcomes funders doesn't pay the same rate for five years. Meanwhile, the rate is now should be 25% lower or whatever. So there has to be annual reviews built in. Now, the key issues within social impact bonds, and there are many, we do not have social impact bonds in particular, not many in South Africa. It's growing very, very, very quickly in, in, in Europe, in Australia, other emerging markets. And the first thing, and probably the most important thing is, we have to think outside of the box because this model is different to what we used to. One of the largest KPIs for any finance related issue within a government department is the disbursement of his allocated funding. Now, in an outcomes-based model, because you're only disbursing on a particular outcome, there is no guarantee that that is going to be disbursed or allocated, or the allocation, the full allocation is disbursed. So, the thinking around your starting point is that I must disperse my budget. In an outcomes-based model, that cannot be a starting point. Because remember, the efficiency that the, the outcomes-based model brings speaks to disbursing less for more. Um, then the second one is credible intermediaries. I think it's fair to say, and in our experience, the intermediary is the most important entity within a outcome space model because everything goes through the intermediaries. The outcomes funder will contract through the intermediaries. The implementers will contract through that intermediaries. In a social impact bond, the investors will contract via that intermediary. So it's fair to say that the intermediary is the crucial, the glue within the ecosystem. Now, we have found that there is a distinct lack of depth within the market. There are players, good players, that, that, that would do this view, bonds for jobs being one of them. 
but there is no depth in the market. So it limits the how many ecosystems one could actually develop with, 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 within the sector. Um, the outcome triggering payment must be clearly defined and agreed upon and measurable at the start. And I think I've spoken about that. And very important, the alignment between investors and outcomes funders. So in a job for argument's sake, if an investor is willing to invest for a three months job, right? But the outcomes funder wants a 12 month job. Now, somewhere there's a disconnect because the implementer is going to have his three month job. He said that to the investor, I've met your target. So we then go to the um, outcomes funder and say, right, now you can pay the outcomes funder says, no, that's not what I want. So there has to be clear alignment between the expectations of investors and outcomes funders. Um, we must understand the cost, the cost of delivery from operators, which informs the rate card. In creating a job, it is not enough to simply say, I'll pay you 50,000 Rand for a job. You've got to understand what it cost is to create that job. And in, in, in our analysis, when we did research on a particular project that we implemented, we actually went to three or four of the private institutions and said, if, I, if you're going to create this job, what cost? So is that type of analysis that is required for the rate card um, less um, the outcomes funders would overpay on, on all of this. The rate of return to investors, which is peculiar to SAB, um, to social impact bonds, that has to be determined. Um, and I know it's, it's not within the nature of government to pay for these returns, but to attract investors, one has to offer them a return so that they can fund and provide the capital out fund. Because remember, they're taking 100% of the risk in investing in that. Because if the outcomes are not achieved and speaks to the efficiency of government spend, the outcomes funder does not fund anything, right? So one needs to be very careful and very clear on, on, on how, what that return, what is acceptable, what is equitable. And then, of course, risk sharing. Um, the problem with the social impact bond is at the moment, I don't think we've got our head around how to address the risk that investors take and how to price that risk. Because an investor will say, you expect me to put a mil 100 million rand into achieving a particular outcome, but I have no control over the achievement of that outcome. So my risk is multiplied, uh, whereas the outcome funder has no risk. So that is, for me, a key issue that needs to be addressed going forward for social impact bonds in particular to take off, um, as it has in many other, uh, other countries. Thank you, Nesh Machin. So this is an example of one. Uh, it's in the green economy. It's a, it's a pay for performance model as opposed to a, a social impact bond. And what, what was achieved there was we, a grant was made available which crowded in uh, uh, commercial funding. Commercial funding is invested into approved SMEs. The outcomes funder being the jobs fund in this case would fund based on a particular rate card per category of job to each of those investors when jobs are created from that. Uh, the level of leverage in this project was about 5.3 times. Um, and yes, the availability of the grant has reduced the returns expectations of those investors and therefore um, have those investors have been able to provide that funding which on average is about prime some is below prime and very importantly we in one of our projects we were very happy to see that where the investor will link the interest rate of the loan made to the sme to performance of specific impact criteria. So if you create 10 jobs, we'll give you 100 points, 100 basis points off your, your interest rate or 25 points, whatever the case may be. And I think we are very interested to see how that plays out um, because I think it is far more, it's, it's an innovative way of looking at setting a rate for SMEs as opposed to setting one rate across the term of the, of the loan to actually link it to delivery of impact criteria. Next slide, please. So overall, what are the success factors or imperatives that we as a job fund see 
that it, that has to be present within the blended finance. I have to say that, and this was not by design. Um, this has come up the learnings that we've had over a number of years. It does closely correlate to what the OECD recognized as, as key success factors or imperatives. The first one is additionality. If your grant is not unlocking, if funding was going to be made available to a particular industry without grant funding, there is no additionality. There is no place for the job fund to play or government, I suppose, unless you're scaling. Very importantly, that grant or initiative must be must test the change in behavior of commercial lenders. What often happens is an SME will fund will be funded year one at a rate of let's say ten percent because his risk is perceived high. Next year, five years later, after paying loans back every year, he will still be rated at the same risk level. So we have to uh, promote or test changes in behavior of commercial lending by testing these models, proving the concept, showing that risk. If projects are implemented in a particular way within certain parameters, a risk can be reduced by alternative measures as a opposed to, to, to what uh, uh, commercial funders have generally used and the resulting in greater access and lower cost of capital. I think the allocated grant must um, crowd in commercial funding, otherwise the model itself has no additionality. I think one thing one must be very careful of is minimizing distortion in the model. So if one simply makes funding available generally for lending to, to, to SMEs without the particular codes or certain aspects being tested, you run the risk of simply sweetening the deal for that commercial funder, because what that commercial funder could potentially do is simply fund the same 50 SMEs every year with that money. And that is not what, what the JOS Fund is trying to achieve. We're trying to widen the base of SMEs that can exist by testing new code under various circumstances. Um, must drive leverage. I think in, in your discussion, in our discussions with uh, potential partners, I think this takes the longest because, of course, we're trying to push boundaries. If you're asking me for 100 million rand in grant or 50 million rand and you say I'm going to give 100 million, my first job is to say, no, 100 million is not good enough. I want 400 million. And we, we, we sit and we haggle about that. But the grant has to drive the leverage. But what is that optimal ground for a given level of leverage? And I remind you of what I said earlier, one has to be careful to not push that boundary so far that it ultimately hurts the end beneficiary via a higher blended rate. Um, consideration must be given to specific issues, transactional, geographic. For example, a SMEs in Limpopo may have a very different problem to what SMEs in the Western Cape may have and vice versa, right? So you have to look at geographic specific issues. You've got to look at sectoral issues. We showed, I showed you two blended finance models, one in citrus, one in deciduous fruits. The project structure is very different to each other because the conditions that prevail within those industries and the condition of the beneficiaries that you're targeting in those uh, 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 projects are very different. So access to market failures, we've got to address root causes. And this is. I think you have two minutes left to do your your piece, please. Oh, okay. Otherwise, yes, I'm, I'm I still have time to ask the questions. <laughs> almost done, Chair. We have to address certain issues, drive systemic change. Um, at the moment, what is often happening is we're simply addressing uh, uh, symptoms of that problem. And that is what the Job Fund is about in testing these various models. Next slide, please. Capacity to implement, very important. You're partnering with somebody, is has got to be able to generate pipeline, something that we have, to be fair to our cost founder. Got to look at how that pipeline is generated and whether he's able, the credit assessment process, what that process looks like, what the credit policies is, and whether a amendment is possible to those credit policies. I've spoken enough about private sector funding, uh, non-financial support, I've mentioned, the capacity to manage a loan book because you in a sector body or industry body does not mean you can manage a loan book. It is a specific skill that is required and one has to look very carefully whether that is so. And then ultimately the aim that we're trying to do is not simply provide an SME with a loan, 
but providing him a loan in a way that he will become, or the SME will become sustainable over time, so he can go off and, and do so without having to, to go through these processes again. What does that sustainability look like? Um, the ability, have, do we have the ability to manage, to track those things? And the exit strategy, again, I come back to that, is vitally important. Um, but again, thank you very much, Jim. I think that that's my last line. And apologies if I went over time, Jim. Thank you, Nazim. We know that you are passionate. I think um, so we can um, allow for adequate question and answer, and we've got some really great questions. Just want to, I just want to emphasize here that the jobs fund through, you know, the challenge fund principles, we enable the selection of and testing of the most competitive and innovative models in the space. Um, there are a number of intermediary, intermediaries offering different things. Um, and, you know, the, the, the process we undertake enables us to, to do just that, to select what, it, what we feel is required given the market, the market um, landscape. Um, and you know, it also assists us in 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 us assisting the government or the uh, policy um, area, um, in and and in the market really to adopt um, a widely used mechanism uh, or widely used mechanisms like you mentioned, Nazim, social impact bonds. Are st we are experimenting a bit, and they're still quite new in the South African space. We also have a, a robust monitoring and evaluation framework, and that builds capacity of our partner intermediaries and beneficiaries alike. I think many of them have come back to us to say, sure, we do put them through the ringer, but it's you know it's just made their processes all the more um, better. And then we have, you know, we take great pride in our grant management system, which allows for solid data collection. Um, so, um, Landiwe, um, thank you for your questions. I will ask uh, Ben to just um, reiterate what he said about the partners uh, and syndication. And then um, Nazim, maybe you want to tackle, German, German has left, but he dropped us a question on some of the challenges we've experienced in, in implementing these models. So Ben, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Eve. Uh, thank you, Landiwe. So um, yes, so we, we do work with uh, different uh, in, uh, uh, sort of uh, intermediaries or financial uh, financial institutions that, uh, that including philanthropic organizations, uh, as far as uh, core funding is concerned, and it's really based on who is applied. And sometimes we have an organization applying and having another organization giving match funding. So we we partner with all and everyone, and. Um, then the question about blending, I said that, so yes, blending is, happens at the project level because at that, at that point, that's where the, the nuts and bolts are at, really uh, what, what the pro problem is at, is really at, at, the, at the project. And then the last one about uh, syndication, uh, the different, you know, our normal our, our structure in syndication, uh, we are not uh, a bank, so we can't go into uh, our syndication uh, arrangements. However, you, you would notice that, let's say if it's in construction or in uh, development or property development, uh, you might have the applicant uh, who is uh, using part of the SMEs that they have as a cohort to leverage on the market of the building of, uh, of, of infrastructure, for example, and they might be part of the syndication themselves. And, but we then can come in only to support the SMEs and using that infrastructure or the development uh, is access to market, so that's um, yeah. I think that's 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 those questions. Thank and you, then, Ben. Sure, sure. Okay, and and then um, I'm Landy. we on on your question on jobs. I mean, I think um, we we we. We approach with caution comparing jobs. Um, we we did an exercise recently where we we compared uh, we tried to compare jobs job creation even within the South African landscape, and and the challenge there is definitions and metrics are different. So so we are definitely. Um, not comparing, or we we take we approach it with caution because of of the danger of not comparing apples um, with apples. But also, I mean, the the average you've used also um, it it 
it doesn't take into account the the big variances within within the portfolio. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have a straight answer for you there. But Nazim, I'll ask you to just um, speak about challenges. Yes, it hasn't been a smooth a smooth ride all all the way. Uh, yeah, to address German's question. I think I think that's true. It's not been smooth. Um, we've had many a conversation about our portfolio performance and so forth. And I think there's three issues that I would want to highlight, three challenges. And I think the first one, the first two is really about the institutional structure of your project and your partners. And the first problem is really pipeline development, right? Market our on lending projects, providing lending or lending to SMEs is a commercial venture, right? And it, it's dependent on commercial or how that market is performing. And pipeline development in that sense has become difficult or has been difficult in recent times because of the deterioration of SME's balance sheets, for argument's sake, during the COVID period in particular. Um, we had a case where at that time where we had a very full pipeline in one project. But in, on assessment of whether they actually qualified for them during post-COVID, it was found that uh, many of them were now not fundable given the impact that COVID had. Okay, and I'll come back to that issue again. And the second one is very often a lot of intermediaries or lenders have a passive method of generating pipeline. They simply advertise their product and they send away. And that we have found does not work. You've actually got to go into the market and generate interest in that, and generate pipeline, speaking to the farmers for argument's sake, and, and trying to understand what their needs are, because the needs are not homogenous, right? And then the appropriateness of your product. One has to constantly assess the appropriateness of the product, the blending ratio, et cetera, to speak to the needs of the, the ever-changing needs of those SMEs. And here again, we want to caution against fixing that lending ratio, fixing the rate at which then um, uh, loans are made, because certain ones would be able to, to, to take a little bit more debt versus grant others, the vice versa. So one has always got to be um, nimble enough to actually recognize those and, and adjust accordingly. And then I think the second problem really is about having commercial entities approve transactions. Now, a commercial entity, including um, DFIs, IDC, Land Bank, you name them, they all have credit policies, okay? Very often, a lot of that credit policy is not developmental. Now, the minute, while there may be acknowledgement from credit committee members that this is a developmental project, et cetera, and therefore we need to look at with a slightly different lens. The minute they walk into a credit committee meeting and a project, um, the discussion becomes a bit difficult, they revert to the original credit policy. So what we have learned is that you have to have amended credit policies to be able to fund SMEs. It cannot simply be business as usual for the commercial funders, but then you have problems with the approval of the transactions on that basis. And I think I've spoken the third one is the fixing of the blending ratio. I think we're not doing any favors by doing that. And it's something one has to look at because we cannot, uh, we, the, the product is not necessarily um, appropriate for the cohort that you're focusing on. So one has to be very cognizant of that as well. I hope I've answered those, that question. Those are three. Obviously, we can go on and mention more, but those for me is the three main. Thank you, Nazim. I just want to check the room at this stage, colleagues, you are able to unmute. So um, are they, I'll take, I'll open for a last round of questions before I hand it over to Najwa to send us off this Friday afternoon. Um, and colleagues, please remember to fill in the evaluation form at this stage. Najwa, I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Thanks for your participation all. Thank you. Thank you, Eve, and thank you to the presenters. 
you know, um, if this was us in a jazz club, we would be saying we are jamming hot on a Friday afternoon and we're jamming blended finance. I hope that all of you enjoyed the session. It, it, it was incredible. I, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Najwa. I'm responsible for this team. I'm responsible for the jobs fund. And I had a great time this afternoon. I mean, what is clear by way of concluding is to say we need a renewed dynamism, dynamism in our approach. The pandemic might be over, but the impact is not. And so we do have to think about how we do things differently. We do need to think about how we work together to leap forward and address the systemic challenges in delivering appropriately structured finance instruments to better support our SMEs. However, as we've said, finance on its own is not sufficient. The Jobs Fund has adequately demonstrated that by working together with the private sector and others, we can contribute to more innovation, which results in both social and economic returns. And I think that is the key. Nazim has spoken a lot about risk committees and, and credit committees, and we often find that in our applicants, um, you know, there is this high level intent amongst leadership to want to do things differently. However, that intent does not filter through the entire organization. And it doesn't always reach those decision-making bodies that have to think differently about how we structure finance, how we support our SMEs so that we can have greater impact. We're not saying do that at the expense of your economic return. We are saying we have clearly demonstrated that you can achieve that. You can have economic returns and at the same time also have social impact and social returns that matter. So on that note, I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to complete the evaluation form. I'm going to thank you for jamming hot with us on this Friday afternoon. I'm going to wish you all a great weekend ahead, and I hope to see you again in one of our next webinars. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.